Hey everyone, welcome back to UWorld Nursing's live NCLEX review series. We're so excited to be bringing you pharmacological questions today. For those of you who are new here, my name is Holly. I am one of the content developer nurses here at UWorld. I also work in the CDICU. I'm joined today by my coworker Alexis. I'll let her tell you a little about herself. Hi, I'm Alexis. I'm an RN content developer here with UWorld, and I have been a registered nurse for a little over nine years. Primarily, I've worked in labor and delivery, and currently, I'm pursuing my MSN in um, to become a certified nurse midwife. I almost yeah, forgot. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I'm excited to go over some maternal health questions with you guys today. Yes. So as always, just a reminder, set your video quality to at least 720p, please. We've got a lot of text on the screen. We want to make sure you can read it. It's nice and clear, especially all of our images and tables. So yeah, and we definitely want for you all to engage with us. So we're going to be asking you some questions that you can respond to us in the chat. And then for a couple of questions, there will also be a poll. So yes. So Alexis and I today are both going to present two questions each. So a total of four. And like I said, it's over pharmacological questions. So when you are in the World Bank, these questions will be under the pharmacology subject. If you are looking at the test plan created by the NCSBN, which is the blueprint for the NCLEX, uh, these will be under the category of pharmacological and uh, parenteral therapies. So these are going to make up about 15% of your NCLEX. So uh, we want to make sure we're covering that broad range of subjects. So like Alexis said, we're going to be doing some OB material today. We want to make sure we're covering everything and she's the expert in it, so we're gonna let her talk about that. Yeah, so we've definitely seen a lot of the student comments with concerns regarding maternal and newborn health. We want to reassure you that the NCSBN, the makers of the NCLEX, don't anticipate that tomorrow as you would go on to a labor and delivery unit and be able to assist in a delivery. But what you should be able to do is recognize unsafe patient situations. So as long as you have an understanding of fundamentals and foundations of nursing, you can typically come to a conclusion. So today I hope to show you that and kind of alleviate some of the apprehension that you have when it comes to maternal and newborn health. Definitely. So we both have our laptops here so we can see your questions coming in. And uh, just like before, we're gonna let you guys answer those questions in between our items. So we'll be asking you for your input, like she said. So we'll have some poll features. We want your questions in between, and then also again at the end, we'll be answering your subject questions as well as your UWorld questions. So uh, Alexis is going to start us off with our first question. Take it away. Okay, so magnesium is commonly administered in obstetrics, whether it's being used for fetal neuroprotection as a tocolytic or for severe preeclampsia um, to prevent seizures. It's important to understand the pharmacology associated with magnesium administration because the failure to recognize warning signs of toxicity can actually be life-threatening for your patient. So let's go ahead and look at the question. Looking at the stem, we see that we have a patient that's 37 weeks gestation receiving IV magnesium sulfate for preeclampsia with severe features. What we are looking for is signs that indicate that the client has developed magnesium sulfate toxicity. So in looking at the question, I like to break it up a little bit. We see here that a client at 37 weeks gestation is term, and we know that they're receiving IV magnesium sulfate for preeclampsia with severe features. But you need to ask yourself, what is the magnesium going to do for the patient? We know that magnesium, do you all know what it does? <laughs> It prevents seizures in patients that are severe preeclamptic or in patients that are eclamptic, meaning that they've had seizures. Um, so we wanna take a look at these symptoms and see how too much magnesium would reflect in a patient. Make sure to ask yourself what magnesium does. I know that magnesium is the central nervous system depressant and it also is a smooth muscle relaxant. So when I think of those kind of manifestations in a patient, I also want to know what it would do to a patient when there's an excess amount of magnesium. So let's take a look at the options. This is a select all that apply, which means one to five of the options can be correct. So for the first option, we have reflexes. The second one, we have blood pressure. The third, we have the client's output. Fourth, we have the respiratory rate. And five, we have somnolence. So we'll give you a second to answer in the chat. What do you guys think are signs of toxicity?
keep those answers coming. It looks like one, four, and five are our most common, so I think we should go with those. All right, let's pick one, four, and five, see how the students did. Geniuses, <laughs> great job. So if you look at the question, you'll see that this is the 2022 version. And so this question and this explanation has a really good image here of magnesium toxicity and the features associated. Um, so you want to, if you want to, you can make this into a note card and just to kind of have the reminder of how the patient would present. Um, magnesium is a high alert medication. And again, it's used as a central nervous system depressant to prevent seizures in clients with preeclampsia. Here we have a nice little image of a reminder of what preeclampsia is. Preeclampsia manifests as hypertension, protein in the urine, and then some severe features of preeclampsia are those signs of end organ dysfunction, headache, right upper quadrant pain, blurry vision. You'll see the patients typically have edema, and so it just is just a good kind of reminder of what you're looking for. Remember that the question isn't asking you to know everything about preeclampsia. What it's asking you about is magnesium. This is kind of just here for a reference or a little reminder of what it is when you're going through the bank. Okay. So I want to kind of combine some of these options. We know that option one, diminished deep tendon reflexes, and option four, a decreased respiratory rate, are both signs of magnesium toxicity. So again, by using some of the fundamentals of, of nursing, you should kind of have an idea for what the electrolytes in the body do. At the very minimum, know at a baseline what each electrolyte does. So when I look at this and I think, what does too much magnesium do to my body? I know that it's gonna relax the smooth muscle. So there's gonna have an increased relaxation in that patient presentation. It can affect their respiratory effort as well as a part of that CNS depression. What I also know is that a lot of the electrolytes tend to have an inverse relationship with the other electrolytes. So magnesium has a similar relationship with calcium. They have an inverse or anecdotal relationship, similar to the sodium potassium pump. When one goes in the cell, the other goes out. So if you know that magnesium and calcium have that kind of an inverse relationship, then what you can think of is if the patient is oversaturated with magnesium, there's an inability for calcium reuptake to occur in the cells. So what ends up happening is we know calcium plays a big role in muscular contractility. And so if there's no calcium and and you have an excess electrolyte that's making you relax, then you're gonna see those diminished deep tendon reflexes, and you're gonna see that decreased respiratory rate, and it kind of just comes into an excess amount of magnesium, and then it inhibiting other electrolytes to do their job. So, then we lastly have somnolence, which is, liter it's basically just a side effect of the CNS depressant. Magnesium does have a sedative effect, so your patients can present as being groggy. Mm -hmm. The difference here are these patients are excessively drowsy. They're unable to hold a conversation. Something that I really want to stress here about somnolence is you can easily arouse your patient most of the time. And if you say, are you okay? They're going to say yes. What you really need to do is have that open-ended conversation with your patient. They need to be oriented to the place, time, and situation. So it's not enough to just shake your patient and say, are you okay? And then they can answer with yes. You need to kind of get that full dialogue to make sure that there's not an issue occurring there. A deep tendon reflex that is diminished, by the way, is an early sign of magnesium toxicity. So. Um, if you start kind of seeing that the deep tendon reflexes are starting to become diminished, which we also have a really good table here. Um, so a normal DTR is two plus, means they're active, normal, unexpected. You want to be assessing for diminished and absent DTRs. 
Something in the OB world that can make assessing reflexes a little bit difficult is a labor epidural. If a patient has a labor epidural and it's very dense, sometimes you may not get that patella response that you need. Um, I'll often ask one nurse to come and help me because all that weight is dependent on one person. And if I can obtain the reflex on the patella reflex, then I'll do one in the elbow or in the wrist. If you start seeing that they're kind of they're not two plus anymore, they're becoming diminished, that's always a good sign to talk with your doctor about maybe getting a serum magnesium level. Because while magnesium levels are drawn, they're not done on a specific protoc protocol and it's uh, provider dependent sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so you need to be able to recognize these signs in a patient because you're not always gonna have the magnesium reference value at your fingertips. So just a little note there. And then <clears throat> if symptoms of magnesium toxicity, especially respiratory, um, de decreased respiratory rate occurs, then your patient is actually kind of close to starting having cardiac arrhythmias mm -hmm. as well as potentially going to cardiac arrest. The infusion of magnesium should be stopped. And then this goes back to the magnesium and calcium relationship. Calcium gluconate is administered to try and push that magnesium out of the cell and kind of bring some life in back to your patient. And whenever you administer magnesium sulfate to a patient, calcium gluconate always has to be readily available. One is not ordered without the other. And then we have option two. This was the incorrect option because hypotension, not hypertension, occurs with magnesium. It decreases that peripheral resistance and so um, usually we would see low blood pressure in a patient receiving magnesium. Um, hypertension that the patient is having is reflective of the se severe preeclampsia, and it should be treated typically with hydralazine or labetalol. Um, and then also, it, it's a good thing to monitor your blood pressure because while we can appreciate the value of magnesium bringing down the blood pressure, Sometimes patients that are severe preeclamptic can be sitting at elevated or even severe range pressures for weeks at a time. And if you drop their blood pressure too quickly, it's gonna make the patient feel pretty terrible. And the baby will also begin to start showing signs on fetal monitoring of decreased perfusion because the blood is, you know, not shunting anymore to the uterus. So something to think of, you kinda of wanna maintain a, uh, a steady decline and not a rapid decline that would occur with toxicity. And then lastly, urine output. Urine output um, less than 30 mils an hour is a sign of end organ dysfunction and it can contribute to the magnesium toxicity because magnesium is excreted primarily through the urine. So if a patient is receiving a high concentration of magnesium, which can be anywhere from one to three grams an hour, depending on their BMI, depending on their renal function, um, and depending on how they metabolize medication, the inability to excrete that magnesium can actually contribute to magnesium toxicity. Patients that have preeclampsia, depending on how far they are into their disease process, mm -hmm. they can already start to have impaired renal function. So you never want to uh, neglect the urine. And the urine that was listed up top, 608 hours, that's more than 30 mils an hour. And since we don't have the patient's weight, 30 mils an hour is the good standard baseline to assess. So in the end, patients with um, magnesium, let's go over the educational objective. So if a serum magnesium, Oh my gosh, if a serum magnesium level becomes too high, toxicity can occur and it can lead to respiratory failure, cardiac arrest, and signs include absent or diminished DTRs, decreased respiratory rate and, ox and or oxygen saturation, and somnolence. Awesome. So we'll give you guys a second to leave some questions you have on this for Alexis. Um, but while you're doing that, I just want to point out, like Alexis said, you know, this is this is obviously an obstetrics specific question, but at the core, it is fundamentals, it is electrolytes, it's fluids, um, and you know, even we get into our ABCs, our airways, breathing circulation, and safety. And so um, really understanding your electrolytes is going to take you far on NCLEX and, and in your nursing practice in general. So um, like she said, being able to recognize those signs and symptoms and especially knowing mm -hmm. what your treatment is when you are at that toxic level, 
uh, is very important. So that way you can help keep your patient safe. And we always wanna be on the lookout being prudent nurses. So that way, when we start having the early signs, like you said, of those diminished reflexes, that we can recognize things before they are too far in a client. And so um, always watching those. And then, you know, I always like to look at it from my, my cardiac perspective. We talk about low urine output here and hypotension. And all of those things say to me that we are not perfusing. And like Alexa said, that can cause um, issues with fetal blood circulation, that can cause issues with maternal circulation. And, you know, in general, if we are not perfusing, like that's just, that's not good. We're not getting not oxygen, <laughs> we're not getting blood to our brain, our vital organs. And, you know, the longer that goes on, the more risk we have for permanent damage. Right. And one thing that I do like to always tell any friend of mine that's about to take their nursing exam, I always say, make sure you know your electrolytes again and know what their buddies are. Yeah. Know which ones go up and go down whenever there's deviations in them and which one has an inverse relationship. By knowing that and knowing your baseline of your electrolytes, you can really kind of determine the presentation of the patient. So, so I'm going to go ahead and add this into our notebook here. Um, I like in the notebook that we can add multiple things. So I'm gonna add the mag toxicity here. And since we have the uh, different issues, we got hyporeflexia and all of those, I'm gonna save this. And then I'm also going to add in this uh, deep tendon reflexes table to it, just so I can have that comparison, excuse me, um, with what's going on. So if you look, it's down here, we will save it. And I can get back up. Ooh. There we go. <laughs> All right, so I don't see any questions coming through on this specific questions. Oh, actually we do have one here. Um, it's about medications and pregnancy. The first I was going to ask is, could you explain a little of why we would give hydrolazine or levetalol versus other drugs? Absolutely. And then someone also would like to ask, um, they've seen about, let's see, in regards to ibuprofen, um, they're asking specifically with a child, which we can get to at the end, but can you speak to like ibuprofen versus acetaminophen in pregnancy? Yes. So, um, first off, we give hydrolazine, which is a vasodilator, um, or labetalol to patients, which is a beta blocker. A way to kind of remember, remember that whenever I was a student was um, beta blockers are okay for the baby. And then hydrolazine, well, one of the names for it is a prezzoline. And so I would say a prezzoline is A-OK -okay, and beta blockers are OK for the baby. You would never want to give an ACE inhibitor to a client that's pregnant because the effects on the kidney can also affect the newborn. And so we don't want to do anything to decrease the functionality of immature kidneys in a fetus. So. We do not give that. And then, yes, Tylenol is preferred over NSAIDs. Um, and that's just because the NSAIDs can cause uh, defects with the newborn. And it also, um, it affects the way the ducts in the heart close. So you can have premature closure of the ductus arterios because of the NSAIDs. And so you, the risk of it just isn't really worth it. Um, there are some NSAIDs like endomethacin that can be given as a tocolytic in pregnancy. And there you that's one of those situations where you have to weigh out your pros and your cons mm -hmm. and the newborn has to be within a certain gestation of the pregnancy. Yeah. So, um, but typically, yeah, no NSAIDs, more Tylenol, extra strength Tylenol, yeah. those types Cetaminophen, of things. we like. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, all right. So yeah, I think on that one, just remember that magnesium is that CNS depressant. And so when we think about the depressant, what are we getting into? And so that would just be kind of smooth, relaxed, all that. Mm -hmm. So it looks like that is all we have specifically for now on that one. And we're gonna go over to our next question. So up next, we have a question about fluids. I know we had somebody asking a week or two ago about fluids specifically, um, and so we wanted to kind of go over that. Uh, this question's nice because these are some conditions you could see primarily, or not primarily, but you could see in adults or pediatrics, and so we like to kind of cover all of that. And so with this question, um, fluids are really important. You are going to give them a lot. Um, they're gonna be ordered. You know, really wherever you work in nursing, you're going to be getting them, and so, um, it can just be kind of confusing, the types, the indications, all those things. 
And so we just kind of want to help you get with that. Um, also, within the test plan uh, that we talked about earlier, it says that test takers need to be able to evaluate client responses to fluid therapy. Nurses need to be able to educate the clients on the need for it, and they need to be able to manage the care of a client experiencing fluid or electrolyte imbalance. So that covers your question you just did, and it covers this one because you know, we're gonna be giving fluids because there's a balance imbalance somewhere. So we also need to be able to monitor our hydration status by looking at signs, symptoms, and manifestations of fluid overload or deficit. So let's look at our STEM here. So we wanna know what prescription we should clarify with a healthcare provider. We've got four fluid orders and one of them needs some clarification we need to talk about before we go forward. So a little tip for you here is we need to consider each component of an answer choice always. So if we look at all of our answer choices here, we've got some commonalities. So in each option, you can see that we have a fluid type prescription. So we've got the fluid here and then continuous or bolus. They're all IV, we notice that. We also can see that we've got um, a condition for each and then our diagnosis. And then we also have a laboratory value for each. So we need to consider all of those and compare them together and kind of figure out which one is, uh, which one doesn't match up with the others. So we do have a poll in the comments if you guys wanna go ahead and answer on what question, or excuse me, what option you think needs clarification. So it looks like we've got 72% saying option one. Nice. So I'm gonna go with that one. <laughs> All right, good job guys. Geniuses again. So again, we got our 2022 version here for you. So I'm going to actually start with this table here um, before we go through, and then I will kind of go back over each option choice while we are on them. So I'm gonna scroll down. All right, we're just gonna go this way with it. So um, understanding the difference between isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic is really gonna help you in your, uh, in your practice and on your NCLEX. So the biggest thing to understand with fluid types is they are all about osmolality, all about the concentration. And so this is uh, the plasma and the extracellular fluid in comparison to the fluids we're putting in. That is what matters when we think about these fluids. And so um, it, this is going to determine kind of what the fluid is, where it goes, what it does. So in terms of osmolality, um, isotonic fluids are going to be the same osmolality, which is going to be these first ones, as blood and extracellular fluid. Hypotonic's going to be less and hypertonic more. So we'll start at isotonic here. So remember that everything is on a concentration gradient. Water will always follow salt. And um, I'm actually gonna click a little image here first because this is a great way to see it. So we're always gonna move from low to high with our gradient. So hypotonic goes in the cell. Isotonic, just kind of neutral, and hypertonic is going to pull that water out of the cell. So looking back at our chart here, excuse me, our table, we know that our blood always wants to balance itself out if we're not in that osmolality balance. So starting with isotonic, like I said, there is no concentration gradient to travel with, so our fluid's really just going to hang. Your most common you're going to see are 0.9% 0, 0 sodium chloride or normal saline, as well as lactated ringer. Um, so these are going to get, we're going to give these to increase our volume, and this is usually related to blood loss, dehydration, any of those things. So because there's no shift, these are often given um, for what's called maintenance fluids, or um, even for clients experiencing decreased in intake, or those who are MPOs. So oftentimes if you know, they have a procedure coming up we, and we don't want them eating or drinking, or if someone's fatigued, nauseated, one of those things, and not intaking a ton, we can start with isotonic. We can always move on to other things, but this is generally what we start with. So the biggest thing here is our osmolality is the same. Therefore, we're not gonna have a lot of fluid shifting. We're just gonna kind of fill some space. Next, we get into hypotonic. And so hypotonic have osmolality that is less than ECF, extracellular fluid. So this is going to cause, um, excuse me, it's going to cause body fluids to move from that intravascular space into the interstitial tissues and cells. The most, you're going, most common you'll see probably is the half normal saline here, which is 0.45%, excuse me. 
And so really important safety thing on this, you never want to give these to clients who are at risk for increased intracranial pressure because it can cause fluid to shift into the brain tissue, um, which can lead to cerebral edema. That increased pressure is just no good. So think about extensive burns or if there's been a trauma with a lot of blood loss. They're already hypovolemic, and so we, if we cause more fluid shifts, especially into the brain, that balance being upset can just cause a lot of issues and actually be, be deadly for the client. So just remember, if there's a risk for increased ICP, we do not want to give anything hypotonic. So these are most useful when we want to put fluid back into the cell. Um, these can also be given to clients who are experiencing dehydration, usually when it's a little more severe, when we're really trying to get that replacement, especially if we're trying to be aggressive if the client's really dehydrated and they're not able to intake orally to increase. Um, so like I said, you usually start with isotonic there, but you can move to hypotonic and that's that one. Uh, last on here we have hypertonic. So the osmolality is more than that of ECF. So hyper is high, so osmolality is also high. And so um, this causes the body fluids to shift from the extracellular space into the vascular compartment. And once the fluid's in the vein, it can then be filtered by our kidneys and uh, excreted in the urine. So there, I feel like, are a lot of these, um, but the biggest you're going to see would be your dextrose 5% in, or your dextrose 5% or your dextrose 10% in NS, uh, in have an S, in LR, any of those. Uh, you're also going to see 3% normal saline, which would be very, very salty, and sodium filled. This is also going to include all uh, colloid solutions, which I will talk about in a second. And so uh, the important one here, like I said, is that it is going to cause them to shift into the vascular compartment. So this is most useful in our clients who are experiencing swelling or fluid retention. Um, we have to be careful, these kind of walk a fine line because these clients are usually already fluid overloaded. And so we, you know, we don't want to just give them more fluid, but you will sometimes see these ordered alongside a diuretic like furosemide, especially if it's given IV push, and that encourages excretion. So that pushes the fluid that is hanging out where it's not supposed to be into the veins, so that way it can go pass through the kidneys, be filtered and excreted as urine. You'll see these given a lot in clients who have decreased cardiac function, so especially like uh, your CHF, anyone with a decreased ejection fraction, all of those. Um, their heart pump's pretty inefficient, and so it cannot move that fluid through the body like it's supposed to, and they often have a lot of swelling. Um, they may even have some fluid sitting on their lungs, all of that. So lastly, I wanna touch on colloids versus crystalloids. You see right here, we're talking about that. And so with that, I, you probably hear those used often. A lot of people don't know what that really means. So know that crystalloids have the small molecules and provide fluid resuscitation, but are more likely to lead to edema. They're great for the initial resuscitation, but long-term they don't cause as much fluid shifting and just can end up with some swelling. So unless you have uh, a plan for what's gonna happen with that extra fluid you add, or uh, you know the client's kidney function is really good and they can excrete well, um, you wanna be careful with those. Colloids, on the other hand, have larger molecules, so they're gonna give you more dramatic volume expansion within that space and can promote the excretion. They can be natural, so blood, plasma, or albumin, like we see here, and they can also be synthetic, such as dextran or different starches. So it's important to note that crystalloids can be isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic, but your colloids are always going to be hyper. So, I'm gonna peek at this image one more time just to kind of give you an overview now that we've looked at that. And so we've got hypotonic here, which is going to go into the cell. Isotonic, which is just gonna, if you see, you've got the arrow going both ways, just kind of be neutral. And hypertonic, um, it's going to go out of the cell. So you see that red blood cell is gonna shrink down a little. And again, our water is always going to move from the low osmolality to the high osmolality. That's gonna follow that concentration gradient. So now that we've learned all that loveliness, let's look at the question or the options. And I do want to remind you, when you're looking at fluids, this kind of goes with the tip I gave you earlier, just always stop and compare what is happening with your client versus the fluid ordered. Think about what that fluid is going to do. Are we trying to expand their volume? Are they dehydrated? Are we trying to decrease the volume of the body? You know, what's going on there? And if you're ever unsure, be a prudent nurse, ask questions. 
you know, it's okay to ask. We would rather ask a question and feel kind of silly than potentially cause harm or do anything like that. So let's look here. So like I said, option one was correct. Great job, guys. So when we're talking about this long phrase here, acute post-infectious glomerulonephritis, or APGN, <laughs> this occurs um, oftentimes after bacterial infections, specifically with streptococcus, uh, as the immune complexes are deposited into glomeruli. And so the body's immune response to bacteria that's elsewhere can cause a hit to your kidneys. And this decreases the renal blood flow and um, in turn, with that renal blood flow being diminished, you're going to have decreased excretion. So because of that, you're going to have um, potential hypertension and edema. It's really common in children because, like I said, streptococcus is the uh, cause here. Therefore, you know, kids get strep throat a lot, and so it happens. Um, you'll usually see it appear within a couple weeks after infection. If the streptococcus infection is elsewhere in the body, it can take a little longer. But generally, you know, with the throat, it's gonna settle down pretty quickly into there, and one to two weeks is common. So, like I said, we are not filtering much, so the sodium's gonna build up, and the fluid's gonna build up, so we're gonna get increased blood pressure and swelling. And once that sodium's built up, it can be kind of hard to actually get that fluid out. So, the treatment for APGN is going to be restricting our sodium and our fluid. We want to decrease that circulating volume a little bit, reduce the edema to give the body a chance to rid everything. Especially in kids, um, as long as it's caught pretty quickly, those kidneys are going to bounce back. It just takes a couple days. So what's really important here is we should clarify prescription for any fluid for a client with APGN, but especially a hypotonic solution. Because this can worsen our edema, um, the way that it's moving the fluid from extracellular to intravascular space. and you know, it's going to worsen our edema, which is going to worsen our salt retention, and that can eventually lead to pulmonary or cerebral edema, which can be life-threatening. So, like I said, you know, question any fluid order for them, but especially hypotonic. So next, we're going to look at our other incorrect options. So options two and four were both isotonic solutions, and if you recall, one of these was for a client with DKA, and one of these was for a client who has acute appendicitis. So again, our isotonic solutions are going to be normal saline and lactated ringer. These have that same osmolality as the ECF, so we're not gonna have fluid shifting going on. So if you remember from our review a couple weeks ago, the clients with DKA are gonna be dehydrated because the high, high blood glucose levels, excuse me, cause that excessive urination, and we need to replace fluids to prevent shock in these clients. Also, that replacing of fluids will help hemodilute and bring down the blood sugar, which we want to happen. It's also going to stabilize our blood pressure if they're on the hypotensive side. So a client experiencing acute appendicitis is probably going to be having an appendectomy and so or as a result going to be MPO or nothing by mouth. And so with these clients, we, you know, especially it's going to be a little bit before they have their procedure, we want to make sure that they are not going into a deficit of any sorts. So a continuous slow maintenance fluid is great for these patients. Um, that's going to help keep those kidneys perfused, keep things moving, and you know if we get a little extra fluid, that's okay when we go into procedure because you may lose a little blood even with the laparoscopic approach. You lose a little blood. Also, those sedatives that we're going to give, sedatives, anesthesia, all those, can decrease our blood pressure, and so that extra fluid can kind of help keep them beefed up. Um, and again, they'll probably be MPO until after the procedure, so we want to give that as well. And many times you'll continue those fluids uh, after the procedure. And um, we're gonna keep continuing those because we want the body, again, going back to kidneys, excreting medications and really just flushing everything out. So um, we're going to look lastly at our last incorrect option here, which was a hypertonic solution. It's giving dextrose 10% in water to a client who is, uh, has a blood sugar of 50 and is unresponsive. So um, they are hypoglycemic, so we always want to give them sugar. And I want to point out that this option, I'm going to scroll back up uh, to our option here. So here we are, option three. Um, this is a really good option that kind of reminds us of some NCLEX test taking basics that we are only answering based on the information given. We don't know why their blood sugar is low. 
you know, we don't know are they unresponsive because of the low sugar or something else. All we know is they've got a low sugar, they're unresponsive, and there's D10. There's nothing else indicating uh, that the client should or should not receive anything, and so we're going to go strictly by this. Based on what I know about hypoglycemia, sugar is what we want to give. And if they're unresponsive, it needs to be IV because, you know, we, uh, we give IV, we could give IM, but we're not going to try to give them something orally if they're unresponsive. So going back down here to option three. So um, like I said on that, if, if the client was not unresponsive and their sugar was just low, it would be appropriate to give juice, glucose tablets, all of those things. Um, and as long, you know, they would need to be responsive and make sure they can guard their airway. But if they are unresponsive to you, we need to get sugar in them and we need to probably get some fluids going because there's probably something else going as well. So always check, you know, when you're working in a facility, their individual policies. Um, a lot of times you may have standing orders to give glucose in different forms based on uh, your glucose levels. And so um, just be watching with that. And you, know, you could have D10, D50, other things, um, you know, Dextran, even all those. So I'm going to peek at our educational objective here. Lastly, um, just a reminder, these are great for little flashcards, different things if you want to kind of have them for studying later. So APGN leads to the decreased renal filtration, which leads to sodium and water retention. We want to restrict fluids and sodium in these clients and especially restricting hypotonic solutions that would cause fluid to move into the cells and worsen the edema. So I am going to actually add both of these into the notebook together. I feel like these are really good to have on in conjunction with one another. So we've got the table here that tells you all about them. And then if I can go up, oh, I'm sorry. There we go. <laughs> sorry guys, we're on a touch screen here. I'm going to add this image as well. So we will add this in and I'm gonna scroll down, add our content. So there it is. And like I said, so now we can see we've got the picture there, we've got here, and then I'm also going to leave a little note about um, our colloids here. So colloids will always be hypertonic and crystalloids can be, uh, or let me change this actually, let me say, yeah, colloids will always be hypertonic, crystalloids can be hypo, hyper or isotonic. So we'll save that in there. X out. And um, let me see if you guys have some questions here. <laughs> uh, if you guys have any questions specifically on this one, let us know. So I see one question coming in specifically about normal lab values. So our biggest tip on this is going to be uh, looking in your nursing textbooks. These are going to be fairly standardized. Um, there's always going to be a little bit of fluctuation, but we do not provide a list um, just because the test plan also does not, but we want you to look at your nursing textbooks. Uh, those are what are used in formulating the test and formulating our questions. And so for those required lab values that you can find in the test plan, um, the append like an appendix in your nursing textbook or usually sometimes different tables and charts will help you know what you need to use. Mm -hmm. um, when we do release our NGN items though, or excuse me, they are released. Um, once you start seeing those on the exam, we will see some reference ranges there. And if it's, depending on the value, you may see it simply listed as increased or decreased. So um, if we do questions with lab results, we will always try to have reference ranges in the rationale after the fact so you can understand why it's, why it's out of range. Yeah, and also if you're seeing varying values for a lab, we're never going to use, like if one lab is two to four and the other one is three to four, we're not going to use the two or the three, mm -hmm. we're gonna use you know the four because yeah. it's the constant in yeah. both. So you're always gonna, even though there might be small deviations mm -hmm. from the lower and the upper end, we're gonna give you something that's straight in the middle. Yeah. So you don't have to worry too much. 
And um, like I said, with the nursing textbooks, we use a lot of the textbooks that you guys use as students. And so we try to make sure when we're writing questions, similar to what Alexis said, that we are getting right in the middle of those ranges. So you're not going to have a gray area about what, you know, is it hyper, hypo, is it normal, all of those things. So um, like I said, on the NGN items, when you start going through those, you will see reference ranges. But in these traditional questions here, we will be putting them in the explanations. But no, we do not have a specific table or chart for them. And that's because the NCSBN does not have one either. So, yep. So uh, I think we're going to go on to our next question here. And this is going to be Alexis's. All right, so we are going to be looking at a question here about blood administration. This occurs in nursing, whether you're in acute care or long-term care, and the NCSBN test plan states that the GN should be able to administer blood products and evaluate the client response, and that's underneath pharmacology and parental therapies. So this obviously does fall into the <laughs> test plan. It's a very important concept for the student to understand. So let's look at the stem here. The client is being prescribed one unit of packed RBCs because they are experiencing complications of sickle cell anemia. So which of the following actions by the nurse are appropriate? This is a select all that apply. Again, you can choose one, you, or you can choose all of them, <laughs> or anything in between. Um, and here we have an exhibit. So let's take a peek at the exhibit. So our exhibit tells us that the patient has a hemoglobin of six and a blood type of AB positive. So there are a couple of things that you, whenever you're going to administer blood, you wanna know that it's an appropriate intervention. So we know that clients with sickle cell anemia will obviously be in an anemic state. We expect to see low levels of hemoglobin, but typically the range is about eight to 10. And you would transfuse at about two standard deviations below the lowest. So even if a, this patient sat at an eight, a six is more than appropriate to transfuse. And then um, in terms of blood type, you wanna make sure that what you're administering is compatible with AB positive. So while it may not be an option here, you can very much see an option on the NCLEX that will say blood, and blood transfusion is not indicated due to a normal hemoglobin. So just because we're giving you the hemoglobin, you need to make sure that it's an appropriate intervention for your patient. And I'll mention on this one too, uh, what you were saying about the two standard deviations below. Mm -hmm. We don't have uh, anything listing here that's gonna tell us what our client's normal is but we see the word complications here with sickle cell anemia. And so we know that this is indicated based on the fact that our, you know, we've got an exhibit, we've got lab values present and that we are told there are complications. So, you know, of course, like she said, this one doesn't have an option of not indicated, but if we are hearing complications mm -hmm. and anemia and we are getting a low hemoglobin level, mm -hmm. we know that that means blood, mm -hmm. so. Yep. All right, so you guys, looks like you're answering pretty well in here. Seeing a little more of a split this time than normal. Ooh. Oh, yeah, we are. Hmm. All right, well, it looks like. It's taking the four many, and five. How for many sure. options are we going to go with? Two or three? I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of two. <laughs> All right, well, I feel like should we go with more the two? two. Uh, two options, the four and the five, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. It looks like most of you guys are saying four and five, so mm -hmm. we can go with those. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if you guys are right. So use this filtered white type tubing with sodium chloride and verifies client identifiers and blood products with another nurse. What's that? Oh, sorry. I was trying to get to... <laughs> okay. So you guys did a great job choosing four and five, but you also missed Sorry, Holly's fixing things, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> sorry, okay, so four and five are correct. You are going to use a filtered Y-type tubing and sodium chloride, and you do need a two licensed personnel verify for the blood. But compatibility with the blood, an A negative blood type is compatible with an AB positive blood. So let's come down here. Again, you'll see this is a 2022 version of the question. 
So right here we have this beautiful table of ABO blood group compatibility. What we want to look at here is what blood can patients receive and what blood can they donate and then which blood should they stay away from. So here we have obviously the blood types A, B, A, B, and O. And then we have a list of the antigens. The antigens are a part of that immune response that a patient has. And so whenever they detect an antigen, the body doesn't ignite that kind of inflammation and um, that immune response that attacks an antigen because it recognizes an antigen as part of itself. So it accepts the antigen and kind of the nothing else happens from there versus an exposure to an antibody. An antibody, the body detects it as something that is foreign. And so as a response, the immune response will attack an antibody. So for a patient that is A positive, or oh, I'm sorry, we don't have the positives yet. <laughs> for an A blood type, they are able to receive both um, A and O. And then they have anti B antibodies. So if you were to give a B blood type to an A blood type patient, then it would cause hemolysis and what's called like agglutination of the blood. And this is that's just never good. It kind of is a <laughs> cascade from there, a clotting cascade from there. So in looking at an A and a B blood type, they have both A and B antigens. These people are really lucky because they are what we call the universal recipient. They do not carry any antibodies. So whenever the blood comes into contact with donated blood, it's, um, it's going to receive and it's going to go into circulation. And then they donate to A and B blood type. So O blood is, they kind of get, it's not super fair to have it because they're the universal donor. If you have an O blood type, you're probably constantly being asked to donate blood um, because O blood type does not have any antigens. They have an anti-A, an anti-B antibody, but they can donate to A, B, A, B, and O. So they are the universal donor, but they can only receive their O blood type. And again, this is just the lettering, the ABO matching. On top of that, we need to consider the RH factor. The RH factor is the negative or the positive. So A positive, B positive, AB negative. So in this client that is AB positive, that means that the client has the RH factor, which identifies the D antigen. So the client will receive negative and positive blood type with no issue. Where you run into issues are when a patient has a negative blood type because a negative blood type will not recognize the antigen and it will attack that positive blood type. So you can give anybody a negative, but you can't give a negative a positive blood type. So whenever looking at the stem again, we have a patient with AB positive blood and they safely can receive a negative blood because they don't have that uh, reaction to the body um, whenever they come in contact with the D antigen. So if they're AB, they can receive A, B, A, B, and O. And then the positive can receive the negative. So that is really important to make sure that you're taking a look at that compatibility. Um, on top of the fact that you need to know kind of what the antigens and antibodies do, the RH factor incompati incompatibility, it can lead to hemolysis, but an additional kind of OB tip about that is if a client in reproductive, if a female client of reproductive age desires future fertility and she is a positive blood type, uh, I'm sorry, she's a negative blood type and she has a fetus that is a positive blood type because the mom and the fetus are not always going to have the same blood type. What happens is the mom will end up making those anti-D antibodies. And so those antibodies will cross the placenta and essentially attack the fetus because the body is recognizing it as a foreign object and so that whole immune response kind of goes into play. So this is considered, um, this results often in fetal death or um, 
typically in fetal death, and then difficulty conceiving. So this is called the hemolytic disease of a newborn, and this is why in labor and delivery, um, Rogam and RH um, aluminization is really pushed because if a patient is negative and the first time she had a baby, it was a positive baby, if the maternal and fetal blood came into contact with one another, then now the mom has the antibodies. By administering Rogam or that RH alloimmunization or isoimmunization, um, on, when the mom is pregnant again in the future, the body won't recognize those anti-D ant antibodies mm -hmm. and it, the patient can have a normal pregnancy to term. So just kind of something to think about. So yes, option one, it is compatible. Awesome. Okay, and then we have option four here, using Y-type blood administration tubing. That's this handy thing here. Um, in the Y-site tubing helps to separate, obviously, the normal saline that can only be given with blood, right? And the blood product. And it has some filters right down here and also some smaller filters up top. And those help to um, block out any small clots or any like small particulates that are being administered to patients. And uh, important, like Alexa said, we only are giving normal saline with blood. That is just the way things are. And also, um, you know, not in clicks necessarily, but you know, being careful when you're setting up your, uh, your tubing here, you wanna make sure your blood's not backflowing and vice versa mm -hmm. into the saline but we're gonna give that saline after because otherwise, you know, if you look all this in the tubing, it's just gonna sit there and not actually get in our client. And if our client's hemoglobin is six, <laughs> we, wanna, yeah. we wanna get that up. And so that saline's going to flush the blood in and make sure it all gets in before, uh, before the time is up for administration, which we'll get yep. to in a second. Yep, you want your tube basically to run clear after the blood has been administered. And then we also have ensuring um, that it's the correct blood product, the correct patient, by verifying at least two client identifiers, the name, date of birth, and also the blood product with a second nurse before administration. Um, this cannot be delegated to a UAP. It can be done with another licensed professional, like a doctor and a nurse can also do this, or two nurses. Um, and so this is appropriate, and this is a very big check. Um, I don't know what your mm -hmm. like charting is like, but I know for ours, we have to stop and verify, mm -hmm. and there are hard stops to have um, two people signing yeah. to prove that more than one person is verifying this blood before administration. Yep. So it's it's a lengthy process, but it's worth it because you know giving the wrong blood can just not be good for your patient. Yeah. <laughs> We're not helping them at all by doing Definitely. that. Definitely. Yeah. So um, option two, the UAP cannot um, obtain the vitals in the first 15 minutes of blood administration. This is not appropriate task to be delegated because you are at the bedside assessing the client's reaction to the blood. And also, one thing that we know is that clients that have sickle cell anemia, they actually can have a delayed hemolytic response and um, a delayed hemolytic reaction response. And so the nurse wants to make sure that the patient is completely stable before handing over um, delegation of the vital signs for the patient. Once the patient's deemed stable and there's no signs of reaction, then that's totally within their mm -hmm. scope. But the first initial 15 minutes, you're assessing the patient's mm -hmm. reaction and you also want to make sure that um, you know, you, you have your baseline and then see the improvement. Mm -hmm. I always used to tell patients giving them blood was kind of like drinking an energy drink mm -hmm. because it just brings life back yeah. into them. So you wanna be able to document on your patient's um, status changes mm -hmm. through the administration. And important thing to note there, like you said, uh, keywords of initial and assessment. So those need to be RN only mm -hmm. or higher, so yeah. And then lastly, blood products should be administered within four hours just to reduce um, the risk of bacterial contamination. And um, I was, Holly and I were talking about this and I was telling her at the hospitals that I've worked at, they've always come in an ice chest and there's been a clock on top of it. Um, and so if you start running down that four hours, you either need to return the blood to the blood bank so it's not a wasted unit mm -hmm. or it needs to be quickly administered if it's within a reasonable time. 
Um, again, in an OB perspective of things, typically patients in OB are being res getting rapid transfusion. And so if you are ever administering rapid transfusion to patients, then you want to make sure that you're using a warmer mm -hmm. while you run that blood through. Yeah, yep. Um, and on that one, four hours is kind of the general rule of thumb, but again, always check with your specific facility on requirements for you know, how long until you can complete the, or how long for completing the product, and that also goes for, you know, the minimum and the maximum time mm -hmm. to complete, uh, as well as what their policy is on, you know, if the blood leaves the bank, going back, all that stuff, but mm -hmm. for NCLEX purposes, just four hours. Yes, ma'am. And so, again, you just want to make sure that you are aware of blood compatibility. I tend to do better when I write it out, and I always will kind of make a little table similar to the one that was linked up top. Um, to try to make sure that I'm not messing it up. Also, a big tip for whenever you're a nurse, in the case of an emergency, if you have a patient that comes onto the unit and they're hemorrhaging and they need blood, and you don't have time to wait for a type and scream from the lab, all patients can receive O negative mm -hmm. blood. O negative blood is that life-saving blood. And so if you have O negative blood, then I encourage you to donate. <laughs> And also, um, again, going back to the Y type tubing, just you know, decreases the amount of particulate going through that filter, and is administered with sodium chloride. Make sure you're always using the two identifier two identifiers with another nurse, and then do a close assessment of your patient in the first 15 minutes after administration. These are all pretty baseline expectations that you should know as a GN, and I would not be shocked if you saw questions regarding blood on your NCLEX. So, so get comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Question for you, someone wants to know, do we always warm blood when we give it? No, um, it doesn't have to be warmed every time. Um, it's more uh, for rapid administration. Mm -hmm. um, I know I used to have older patients when I worked on med surge initially, before I fell in love with L and D, <laughs> and um, if they were a little bit older, the doctors would say, "Go ahead and put it in a warmer yeah. for them." You know, yeah. so it can make you cold. Obviously, this same way cold mm -hmm. it, um, cold solution yeah. can. So, yeah. um, and on that, with the biggest reason that we're going to warm for the rapid is just because you know that blood is refrigerated um, to nearly a freezing temperature just mm -hmm. to help keep it preserved, and so. If we are rapidly transfusing something that's cold, we can cause extreme temperature shifts, we can cause shock, we can cause all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So if they are being given rapidly, you need to have some sort of fluid warmer on hand. Um, another question we got is asking about administering them before antibiotics or after, as well as should it be in a different line. Um, for the different line, your blood should always, always, always be in a different line. Uh, since especially if there's a reaction of some sort, you don't want to have anything else running, you want to be able to stop it immediately, remove the IV, don't even flush it. Um, we want to keep that separate. And also it's always great to have two lines, uh, if you can, when you're running blood because, like I said, if there is a reaction, we can give medications if needed through the clean line on the other side. Um, asking about administering with before an antibiotic or after, um, I don't... I've never in my experience, you can speak to this one too, seen a specific timing of to give before or after. I think, you know, for me, if a client is really needing some blood, I'm going to give that blood first. Um, but if it's, you know, they need it at some point during the day and that IV antibiotic needs to be right on schedule, that's what I'm going to give. Yeah, um, and you're going to give whatever is more like prevalent mm -hmm. for the patient situation. So if they're getting just like a transfusion because of anemia, yeah. then you can administer the antibiotic and the blood at mm -hmm. the same time. They're going through different um, yeah. lines, so and it's fine. On those, your biggest time um, that would be that would matter would really be like if your client's receiving dialysis mm -hmm. or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, another question that we have, we're asking for tips in terms of answering a SATA. So we do have a blog post about that um, that is going to be linked in the chat. But also when facing the SATA, what I kind of do when I approach them is I take a true or false approach with those items. I look at the question and ask, is this true for this patient situation or is this false? Yep. And sometimes that kind of helps you to roll out which ones to pick. Yep. Um, we've also talked about, uh, um, other Holly last week talked about, um, when we're looking at these, starting from the bottom instead of the top, just to kind of reset your brain and slow you down a little bit. 
and then taking that true or false approach. As well as with that, um, looking at each option and figuring out what the teaching within each option is. So like in this one, you know, it's asking a negative blood. So it's really this teaching here is, can this client receive this kind of blood type? This one being delegating, um, it's are we allowed to delegate the vital signs? Mm -hmm. So looking at them in that way um, can really be helpful there. And another question we have here is regarding the RH null. So that is the absence of any RH antigens because what we focus on when patients are RH negative or RH positive is the antigen D, but it actually can be a RHC and an RHE. They're not as common and they're not as prevalent in terms of the administration of blood. Um, it's a RH null phenotype is rare. And so yeah, I, that's kind of probably over the scope of anything you'll need to know for, for your NCLEX, RH, RH negative or positive yeah. is where you want to hang out. <laughs> All right. Um, and then very quickly, someone asking about how to warm fluids. Uh, this is generally going to be a specific device that you would learn about at your facility workout, so we won't get really too much into that. But we are going to go to our next question and try to get through it pretty quickly. This is our last one. We're at an hour. We want to be respectful of everybody's time here. So our last one here is regarding insulin administration. So insulin is something you're going to see all over your NCLEX. You're going to see it all the time in practice. And you know, no matter what specialty, what department you're working in. So we want you to know basic details about each type and different things with them to help keep your clients safe, um, all the above. And so we need to know, according to the test plan, different laboratory values for clients with diabetes, such as glucose results. And we need to be able to review our pertinent data before administration. So this could be um, lab values, but also pertinent data like, was the client about to eat? Has the client just eaten? Different things going on there. Um, and then also we need to be able to titrate. So you, know, you think of like sliding scale with meals, we need to do that. And administering high risk medications like insulin are important. So all these just go back to maintaining that client safety and preventing undue harm, complications, all of that. So in our question here, the client has received insulin list pro at 7.30 as prescribed, it's important there. So we know that we're giving it correctly, nothing funny going on. And then they have consumed breakfast 30 minutes later. That sounds appropriate to me. So what time would they be at the highest risk for the insulin related hypoglycemia? We've got a poll in the uh, chat feature. We'll let you answer real quick. And then we will go. Okay, it looks like 65% of you are answering option one of 8.30. So we are scrolling down here. So this is a fun little table. So um, on this one here, this is just a great image of, uh, this is just a great visual with the different insulin types and what, what their peak times are. So if you see this would be when it's hitting you the hardest is this top. And so different short acting, all the different long acting, all of those. So remember that insulin is typically excreted into the bloodstream by the pancreas to move that glucose into the cells. So when you have diabetes, you either can't produce enough insulin, can't use it properly, or uh, you're resistant, or combination, all of the above. So we give supplemental insulin to combat the hyperglycemia. Now with that, um, a lot of clients are on a combination regimen, so they may be receiving um, long-acting insulin, morning, evening, different times, and then also that sliding scale we talked about with meals. So this is, um, the dose can vary based on what the client's current blood glucose is, and if they're at home, usually this is determined by the amount of carbs they're going to be intaking. So, um, we're trying to combat that hyperglycemia and keep them nice and level. And so, we always will do a blood glucose check right before we do, right before we administer, so it's usually a finger stick, and um, that will determine how much we're giving mostly. So looking at um, options here, I'm going to show you a little picture here, reminder what hypoglycemia looks like. So we're going to have that clammy skin, the diaphoresis and sweating, you're going to have a racing heart, hunger, shaky, they're probably going to be a little out of it, kind of confused, they're going to be weak just gonna not appear like themselves. Um, a lot of times our clients who long-term have experienced diabetes are going to be able to recognize this in themselves, but if it's new to them or um, if there's a lot just going on, they may not be able to, so you need to be able to recognize that yourself. So looking here, um, 
Insulin Lispro is rapid acting, so it's gonna reach its peak effect one to three hours after it's administered, and that's when they would be at mo most at risk. So that is, you know, 7.30 to 8.30 is the one hour. So um, a little tip for you here, if we go back to our options, when you take your NCLEX, you're going to be given a whiteboard and a dry erase marker. Use that to your advantage. So sometimes I would write out the option numbers and cross them out as I went. Or at a question like this, you know, we've got times listed, so it would be really great for you to go, okay, 8.30, rewrite that as one hour. 11, rewrite that as, let's see, eight, nine, 10, three and a half hours. <laughs> so just rewrite, rewrite all these so you can actually see the time elapsed. And so that way you can reframe the question and have a little bit easier of a time determining what our, um, which time we're looking at for that peak. So real quickly, we'll move through um, short acting insulins on option two. They're gonna have their peak one and a half to five hours after they're administered. So that would be that one. And then options three and four are going to be our intermediate acting and some of our long acting even um, falling under those. And so this question's really just about knowing your insulin time. So I'm gonna switch real quick to this table that we have. Um, so as you can see, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but for NCLEX purposes and even in practice, the three things you need to know in regards to your insulin types. Have a rough idea of your onset of action. You don't need to be overly specific. Um, most of the time, if you're asked, you're going to be asked more with your onset of action for like your rapid and short acting um, because these are going to be the ones that hit you harder. You know, if we've got all these overlapping times here, it's, you're really not going to be asked when there could be three different insulins that it could be there. And so onset of action, knowing that when it first hits them, the peak effect, which would be when they're most at risk for hypoglycemic events, and then the duration of the effect. These are the three things to know. And so we've got our rapid with some examples, short, intermediate, and then we've broken up the long acting insulins here just because they are so different. And so you can see this can be up to 42 hours. And important to note with our long acting that um, these may not, you know, the first couple doses, you may not see as much change in blood glucose and that's okay. Usually it can take a couple doses to actually happen. So switch back here. Um, so on that one, like I said with that, the biggest things to know on your insulins are going to be the, uh, the time that's going to hit the client, the time that's going to, you know, actually get into their system, the peak and the duration. And so we, with rapid acting, are going to be looking for the hypoglycemic events one to three hours after administration for the most part. Again, someone who is experiencing diabetes can have an event at any time, but this is when we're going to be most watching them. And so on that, and just remember the difference in a couple of units in a syringe can be really easy to miss. So just be careful with your administration. I know some facilities require uh, two nurse sign off with administration, and, but whether it does or does not, you need to be very careful um, just as a safety concern <laughs> for that. And so, I uh, know we went through that one a little quickly, but if you guys have questions on that or others, go ahead and leave them in there. And while you guys are leaving your questions, I'm gonna go back through our test taking strategies here that we've been over today. So let's see, are we at number one here? Yes. So number one, when we looked at this magnesium question, um, we really want you, this is kind of our tip here, to hone in on what your question is asking you. So NCLEX isn't really gonna give you too much fluff, um, but you still sometimes need to filter things out. So we wanna to get to the crux of the question. In this case, we're really just trying to identify magnesium sulfate toxicity. So all this is great to know because we have just kind of a better idea of what's going on with the client, but at the end of the day, the question is simply about this. And so like Alexis said, you know, OB is just another part of nursing at the end of the day. And so if you can recognize this, you can get these questions right. Yeah, and just try and see if you can separate the pregnant client from the question that's being Absolutely. asked. Because sometimes it's in there to kind of throw you, mm -hmm. but you can usually rationalize the correct answer just, again, by using those fundament fundamentals and foundations of nursing. So by knowing your electrolytes, you can answer this question. Definitely. So, um, let's see. In the next question here, um, 
we want you to consider each component of the answer choice and how they go together. So like I said, not gonna have overflow, especially if it's in the option, you're probably going to need them and you wanna consider how they go together. So we remember this one that, you know, this type of solution is not going to go good with this condition, so that should alert us. Uh, lastly, or excuse me, thirdly, you got this one here. We want you to review your test plan, have those required lab values, and um, always think about with conditions like sickle cell anemia here, look for words like complications, look for different things that tell you what we are needing to do here. And so hemoglobin is one of our required values for the test plan, and like we said, look at your nursing textbooks in different places mm -hmm. for those values. Um, hemoglobin is one of the few that I feel like male and female are going to have different values. And if the sex of the client is relevant to the question, it will tell you Otherwise, it's not going to mention it unless it's Yeah, it's going to be in. right in the middle. Yeah. yeah. So um, look at that. And then lastly, on the fourth one here, our tip was use that whiteboard and marker that are given to you when you take your test. You're not going to have any paper or anything to write on. So this is really your place to just brain dump. I have, you know, I know some friends that got in there and wrote down lab values they remembered and things like that. Just whatever you need to help yourself. And um, especially while you're going through questions, if you need to rewrite answer choices or even just be able to cross out for yourself, go for that. So we're gonna quickly answer a couple questions. I know we've gone a little long here, but let's see what you guys have for us. So one question was about asking about ibuprofen in children. Um, it looks like when they went through our bank, um, there's not a lot that says it's contraindicated. It is suggested to be avoided um, in children with acute kidney injury or with hemophilia. Um, but otherwise, no major contraindications. Um, there are questions where you don't want to give aspirin um, and it's contraindicated due to the risk of developing Ray's disease. Um, and otherwise, um, that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of the only other association yeah. that we um, could see. From a cardiac perspective, we want to be careful with ibuprofen just because of that increased risk of heart attack, stroke. Mm -hmm. um, you can also have liver issues. And um, if anyone has peptic ulcer disease or any sort of GI, we have to be careful too because that can worsen things. So that goes for kids or adults, um, but for the most part, it is not necessarily contraindicated in kids. It is uh, more with specific conditions, like Alexis said, with Ray syndrome being that big risk um, and fever and all of that. So just remember your difference. You've got ibuprofen, aspirin, acetaminophen. I know it can be confusing, especially here in the US, US where we talk a lot with generic versus name brand drugs. Mm -hmm. But remember, generic is what you need for NCLEX. Yep. And then again, just to add um, a couple questions about select all that apply. Um, there are going to be some videos as well that have been linked in the chat that you guys can look at. Um, and then something to just remember with this data is um, take it one at a time. Don't try and kind of answer them all at one yeah. time. Break the question up and see if it's applicable. Um, and also we have questions about the self-assessments that are on the um, platform or mm -hmm. on the yeah. product. And so we have two self-assessments. They have the same number of items and they are both formatted with the same difficulty level to match the test plan the NCSBN gives as a blueprint. So the layout is gonna be very similar to what you would be encountering on the NCLEX. So yes, mm -hmm. one is not harder than the other. Um, we always suggest that you take a self-assessment at the beginning of your studying, go through the bank, and then before your test, take your um, yeah. second self-assessment as long as you've made some progress and that's all we like to see. Yeah. Um, and then on that too, just a reminder that those self-assessment questions are not found elsewhere in the bank. They're going to be new to you, so there's not going to be any bias or anything of I've seen this item or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we yeah, said same difficulty and um, the breakdown, like she said, is the same percentage-wise as the test plan breakdown mm -hmm. is. Um, I did want to say one more thing on the ibuprofen. Um, I think infants under six months, we are not going to be giving. And beyond that, it would just be you know, up to physicians uh, if there's any risk of renal disease, especially in younger children. They may want to stray away from it or give smaller doses. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like other than that, that's about it. Um, I think I'm looking to see if we've got any other. Um, I think that's about it. 
So yes, when you are, someone's asking about selecting all the correct answers um, on SATAs. Mm -hmm. So on the current NCLEX and on any of the standard questions, if you have a select all that apply question, you must get every, you must pick every option that's correct and none of the incorrect options to get the question correct. But with the next generation NCLEX that will start in April of next year, um, there are going to be some question types where you can get partial, partial credit, credit. Yep. and those will have a lot more options to pick from. You know, instead of five or six, you can have, I think, up to ten it is, something like that. And so, um, you know, those that's a lot there, and so they're going to give you a little grace on it and let you have some partial credit. Yep. So, um, let me make sure I didn't miss anything else. Someone's asked about NSAIDs in pregnancy. Don't give them. There you go. <laughs> They thought they were correct, but they wanted to be verified. Mm -hmm. um, just a reminder that all of our previous reviews are posted on the channel, and this one will be as well, so you can share with your friends all those things. I know sometimes you can't get on right when you're wanting to start, or right when we're starting, and that's okay. You can always go back and rewatch. And um, this one has run over a little bit, so yeah. if you had to go, you can come back and come finish back. it up. <laughs> but it looks like I think those are all the questions we're going to get to now. So. Um, yeah, so I just want to say thank you guys so much for joining us for the U World Nursing Live and Clicks Review. So join us next week, please, on July 20th, again Wednesday at 2 p.m. And we're going to kind of cover a cool topic. It is psychiatric pharmacology. So we'll be looking at those medications and everything with them specifically. Uh, Alexis, do you want to tell them about the following week, though? Yes. So the following week, July 27th, we are going to be doing viewer's choice. So we want to hear what y'all want to learn about. So go ahead and follow over after this video is over. Go to Instagram of you World Nursing and take the quiz. It's going to be on our stories. Let us know what you guys want to hear about. Let us know what areas of concentration you want mm -hmm. for us to talk about because there's, I think, only a few more of these streams yeah. left. So we want to make sure we hit all of y'all's main concerns. If you don't have Instagram, don't worry. When this video is posted, you can leave them in the comments here as well. Yeah. So just a reminder for you, we do offer the 30, 60, 90 day subscriptions uh, for those short term study study periods uh, with or without those self-assessments and we offer all the way up to two-year subscriptions if you want to use UWorld all the way through nursing school. So um, you can go find those on our website. I know we've linked a lot of different study plans, different things like that in the comments. I encourage you to go poke around the website. There's a lot of good um, frequently asked questions and answers on the website. So other than that, always reach out to us on social media, email, whichever you prefer, and we will try to answer your questions as best we can. Yep. And but if we didn't get to your questions today, we'll make sure to take a look in the yes, chat and definitely. hopefully get back to you next week. Yeah. So that's all we've got for you guys. Thanks for hanging with us a little long today. But other than that, we'll see you next week. So happy studying. Bye, guys. Have a good one.